I don't know if uh, Dr. James Naismith had him in mind exactly when he hung the peach basket, <laughs> but uh, he's made his mark, certainly. Certainly, Dr. Naismith did also, and, and with Black History Month closing out now, a great story here on John McClendon, who a lot of folks may not know about, but I know you had some great time to spend with him. Yeah, great time, E.J. It's, it's not many times that you're just in the presence of someone that you're in awe of them, uh, from their life experiences, from what they've accomplished, not only for themselves, but for society. And when you're around John McClendon, that's how you feel. My sixth grade class went to see the new Northeast Junior High School. There was a gym in it. And I had never seen an indoor gym. That fascinated me in itself, something to play indoors on. But there was a man in the middle of the floor who was shooting basketball. And I stopped and watched him make those shots over and over again. He missed a few, but he looked like he made them all almost. And I couldn't get over it. I ran home and told my mother I was going to be a physical trainer and coach basketball. She told me, you're not, you're going to be a doctor and your brother's going to be a lawyer, and your sister's going to be teachers. And they were. And I was a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> he is 83 years old, just two decades younger than the game he loves, a pioneer in the African-American sports movement. John McClendon, known by all of his students as Coach Mack, is the last living link to the founder of the game, Dr. James Naismith. Dr. Naismith, he knew about my wishes and he advised me or told me that uh, you're on the right track. That He let me know that anytime you have a good cause, there are more people for you than against you. In 1891, Dr. James Naismith tacked a peach basket to the balcony of a gym in Springfield, Massachusetts and tossed a soccer ball through it. Naismith later moved to Kansas where his first student was the legendary coach Fog Allen. 24 years later, John McClendon was born in Hiawatha, Kansas, just 40 miles from Dr. Naismith's front door. My dad said, well, I found out where the inventor is. It'd be better for you to go where the inventor is than where the game was invented. Then you can be taught by the inventor. And it was his idea for me to go to the University of Kansas. You're going to have some rough times up there, but don't forget what you went there for. And if you have a problem, I'll be up there at my 44. As the first black physical education student at Kansas, John McClendon soon found truth in his father's words. Everybody knows the story. I jumped in the pool and they emptied, they emptied half of the pool when I got out. And, and uh, I simply went back the next day and jumped in again. And I told them they're going to have a big water bill in Kansas, biggest one, if they, if they kept this up. They had a rule in Kansas, this wasn't just Kansas University, the blacks were not supposed to teach white kids at all. I didn't mind the reverse, but you couldn't do it. Dr. Naismith said, well, here's how we beat that. We'll, we'll get you a job at the high school being an assistant coach. For Coach Mack, the assistant coaching position at Lawrence Memorial High School will mark the beginning of a career that spanned five decades. In 1940, McClendon was named head coach at North Carolina College for Negroes. It was there he developed the fast break, which he believed was the future of basketball. Just as I was playing with him, he had just come out with a book called Fast Break Basketball, and that if we could outrun the other team, then chances are we're going to beat them. He sort of changed the game from an up and down game to a running uh, type game. He uh, believed that if he conditioned you and ran you, that you would be in shape to fulfill all of the basic skills. In 1944, at a time in America when blacks and whites had separate restrooms, drinking fountains, and unequal schools, Coach Mack once again tested the limits, challenging all white teams to a game of basketball. In 1944, I said, we ought to have an integrated competition in the state of North Carolina. There's Duke right over there. Across town, there's a University of North Carolina, 12 miles away, there's North Carolina State. I did get a reply from the coach at Duke saying that I could come to the game out there, but if I came, I'd have to sit on the end of a bench and wear a waiter's coat. Coach Mack and one of his players, George Parks, pressed on, doing the unthinkable, organizing a secret game with the Army and the Navy students of Duke Medical University. We agreed to play them in secret. We had an official game 
officials, timekeepers, everything. No spectators, they said. And the only spectators were those that had heard about the game through the grapevine, and they stood on boxes and barrels and everything, ladders outside of the gym looking in to see the game. They had never seen fast break basketball. And uh, we pulled out all the stops on them and doubled the score, 88-44. In 1957, Coach Mack became the first African-American coach to win a national championship at Tennessee a and It was a time when black schools weren't allowed in the NCAA tournament. Opposing the Southeast Oklahoma State team for this national intercollegiate basketball championship tonight is Tennessee State College of Nashville, coached by J.B. McLendon. Coach Mack's a and team dominated the NAIA, winning three consecutive national titles in the late 50s. One of the best teams I ever saw was in the Industrial League. Of course, that's out of college. That's the team we got together and beat uh, the Olympic team. With Oscar Robinson, Jerry West, Terry Dishinger, and Bellamy. We beat them over in Canton, Ohio, August the 6th, 1960, before okay. 9,000 people. Right. Of course, they put it on page four in the plain dealer about this big. And they said they didn't want the team uh, embarrassed, and uh, they didn't want the public to lose confidence in the team. That year, he became the first black to coach a pro team, the Cleveland Pipers of the ABL. But his tenure proved short. At halftime of a game, the Pipers' new owner came to the locker room and told McClendon he had just traded one of his Pipers to the opposing team. The player was to suit up for the opposition the second half. The owner, George Steinbrenner. I've avoided talking about uh, Mr. Steinbrenner. Uh, that's uh, who we're about to talk about. Because um, at the time he took over the Pipers, he changed them from an industrial league team to a professional team. And I, by that move, I became the first black professional basketball coach. In 1966, McClendon moved to Cleveland State University, where he was appointed the nation's first black head coach at a white institution. Today, he still teaches a class on sports and minorities. You're a student of Dr. Naismith. Yeah. which also Fog Allen, yeah. which Dean Smith played for, who I played for. Yeah. So in a sense, you can say you're connected to every NBA player. I have some grand, grandson players, I call them, in the NBA now. And, uh, for instance, uh, Bill Lasseter played for me, and he coached uh, Morning. Dave Smith played for me. He was in my classes in basketball and he coached the Wilkins brothers. Uh, Horace Howard played for me. He coached Terry Cummings. It does me a lot of good to see them playing as well as they play and feel like, uh, even though it's a secondhand manner, that I had something to do with their development. In 1978, John McClendon followed his teacher into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Coach Mack is the root from which great players have evolved. Thanks largely in part to the two who touched him before he touched any of us. My dad came up and patted me on the back and gave me a hug, said, I'm proud of you, son. My mother, a little short lady, she was my second mother. She came up and said, uh, I want to ask you something. And this is in the middle of all this celebration. I have my doubts about anybody that let their whole life be decided by what five people do with a ball. <laughs> I still have my doubts. <laughs> <laughs> that was her way she was saying she was happy. <laughs> what a wonderful way. I can see why you're in awe of him when you sit there and talk no, to him. No question. I mean, he's a man that not he was the first of so many things, not only in terms of being the first black coach, he was the first one to really play fast break basketball and every single player I don't care what level you are, you are connected to that man some kind of way. He can speed up the game with a fast break, slow it down with the four corners. A great job, mm -hmm. too, to Gayla Jones, who produced that piece for us on John McClendon. Time well spent. When Inside the NBA continues, what's up with the Lakers, you ask? Well, Dennis Rodman is in uniform, and he's playing. And this is his first rebound as a member of the Lakers. More on the Worms' Hollywood premiere when we come back.